Welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm Justine Reichman, your host, founder of Next Gen Chef. And today we have with us Megan Rokri, the co-founder of Byte Technology. Welcome, Megan. So pleased to have you. Thank you for having me. Excited to chat today. Me too. Uh, so tell me, I'm excited to have you, but I really just want to introduce you and Byte Technology to our listeners today. A lot of people are not familiar with it. They've probably seen it. They did not know it was Byte Technology. So we want to share with them what Byte Technology is. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. So in a nutshell, what Byte Technology does is through our hardware and software, we allow food companies to sell their food completely unattended. So for those of you who are watching on video, you can kind of see behind me this uh, glass front refrigerator. We outfit, outfit that refrigerator with sensors as well as a point of sale. And at that point, you can sell any type of food, salads, drinks, sandwiches, heatable entrees, snacks, completely unattended. And so we operate, um, I sh shouldn't say we operate, but we power the kiosks of several hundred clients across the US and we have close to 1300 kiosks live at this point. Wow, that's a, that's a, that is a lot. So yeah. I wanna go back to the beginning. So when you came up with this idea, were you originally a technology? Like, did you come up with it? How can I get all these people to buy this food uh, through this refrigerator? No, we, the company looked very different. So when we first started, the, the common thread is that the problem we're trying to solve is to make fresh, healthy food very convenient. Um, and the original way we did that was we launched as a meal delivery company, direct to consumer. We would deliver meals directly to uh, people's households. And we ultimately found that the economics and the kind of the potential to scale that business were, would require a lot of funding. And, um, and so we really rethought, okay, how do we still hit that need for convenient, fresh, healthy meals, but hit consumers where they're already spending time away from home. And so that was workplaces. And um, we pitched this concept to workplaces where we would basically go in and stock all these meals that would be available for sale. And then their employees could buy, you know, breakfast sandwich or a salad and a juice uh, or a snack at 3 p.m. And so the, the workplace got tremendous value, right? So generally workplaces want to have fresh, healthy food on site, but most of them can't afford to either cater and pay for the full cost of that food, or they're not large enough to have a cafeteria. So this really, we stumbled upon this multi-billion dollar market. But the second piece of that equation, of course, was we needed the technology to enable that to happen. And, um, and so that's really what was started our path into becoming a technology company um, at our core. So when you first started this, were you actually making the food? We were in the very, very early days because we had been operating a kitchen um, and doing meal delivery. And there were a few months where we operated both businesses in parallel. So we were still doing direct consumer meal delivery. And then we had a few of these kiosks and workplaces. And so initially, yes, we prepared all of the meals that would go into the kiosks, but ultimately pivoted away from that and more towards buying food wholesale mm -hmm. um, to allow us to really focus on just getting out there, doing the operations, selling the service into more and more locations. Over the course of a couple of years, we scaled pretty quickly to over 500 locations in the Bay Area and in broad and beyond workplaces, into hospitals, apartment buildings. I mean, we were in San Quentin a Correctional Facility uh, for the employee population there. Um, and so we really wanted to simplify our lives as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we didn't continue operating a kitchen. And we continued that kind of simplification where uh, when we were looking at how we scale that model, when you look at servicing several hundred kiosks in a given market, you open market by market. So it's not like we could light up LA and Austin and New York and Seattle all at once. We probably could with a you know, <laughs> decent amount of capital, but um, we really rethought, okay, we can either continue building and operating, uh, building the technology and operating the service ourselves, or 
we could pursue really licensing the technology and just getting this into existing food companies' hands. And so ultimately, we ended up selling off that service side of the business in order for us to really focus in on the hardware and the software that we build. Uh, okay, so that must have been, was that a hard decision to make, to decide to do that? When we, when we finally came, because it was always kind of a, a background decision we knew we'd need to make at some point, but when it came to it, it was very easy because we were looking at the, the results of at year end of 2018 and our licensing business just doubled organically that year with zero sales support. So it was very evident that there was clear demand for being able to sell fresh food unattended um, in these kind of new retail channels as we think of them. So at that point, it became pretty a pretty easy decision. Uh, yeah, so I'm just curious. Um, so you decided to now focus on this retail division. Was fueling those retail division with healthy food paramount to it as well? Or were, was it not about the kind of food you were putting in there, but more about just providing um, the refrigerator to whoever wanted it? It was always leading... I think at the end of the day, when you compare to what the other options were in some of these locations, it was a vending machine, right? It was, you know, Lay's potato chips and Snickers bars. And so um, health was always number one, for sure. Uh, but it was also uh, creating a well-rounded set where somebody could get breakfast, lunch, dinner, or snacks in those in-between times. So we would, we would sell everything in that range. Um, of course, salad, sandwiches, burritos, wraps, um, juices, kombuchas, hard boiled eggs, um, breakfast burritos, breakfast sandwiches, you know, the full breadth of, of kind of your on the go meals. All, it sounds all healthy though. It, most of it, most of it was healthy, but you'd still have like a, you know, occasionally of like a mac and cheese, for instance. So it was, it was balanced, <clears throat> but it was all fresh. It was all fresh. Yeah. Yeah. So. And how, I'm just curious, because it sounds like the market is really large. You were just mentioning that. And if I can, can you go back and just talk about a little bit about the size of this market that you were able to uh, carve yeah. out for yourselves? Yeah, it's, so there's, there's this market of, of workplaces in particular that are too small to have a cafeteria. They can't afford to cater, but they still want to have fresh food on site. And, and typically the only... Um, if you've got like over 100, 150 people up to where you bump against having an actual cafeteria on site, vending operators will serve that segment, but it's still just vending packaged food. Right. So there's that segment. And then there's all the workplaces with 100, uh, under 150 employees that vending won't even touch them, who those are the guys that may want to have food on site, but they don't even have any options. And so it was, it was basically everyone below needing a cafeteria <laughs> that um, we found a way to unlock through offering fresh grab-and-go meals, um, which previously wasn't possible because when you look at the need for this technology, in order to sell fresh meals, you have to have flex flexible shelving because your packaging form factors are very different. You can't dispense you know, a salad from a coil vending machine. Um, you need the data because it's highly perishable product. And so when you're going out and you're replenishing several hundred kiosks in an evening, you need to know what's in stock, what's about to expire and what needs to be delivered, um, which is oftentimes not data that a vending operator would know. Um, so there were a lot of pieces of this market that were just simply unlocked by this technology. Um, and, and yes, we stumbled upon the market, certainly. <laughs> The other piece that I'll, I'll mention, though, is that even these smaller offices where, um, you know, they, they would buy food, but not in enough volume to actually be profitable on food sales alone, there was a willingness to pay for the service. And so we would charge $500 a month just for the service, the coming out at a regularity of anywhere from two to five times a week, you know, continuing to update the product selection. Um, taking all the risk of any food that didn't sell, sell that we would have to donate. Um, and so that really made the economics in our favor there. I'm sorry, uh, can you just explain that a little bit in greater detail for me? Are you talking about as bite technology for the kiosk you would charge that? No, as, as, um, as the, when we were operating the service ourselves, okay. the workplaces that were too, 
that weren't generating enough food sales volume for it to be profitable, they were willing to pay a subscription fee. And when they paid a subscription for that service, then it became profitable, even though they were a very small location. Got it. Okay. I just wanted to differentiate because <laughs> there's a couple moving parts here. Mm -hmm. So, because we had pre bite technology and now we have bite technology. So, for our listeners, I just want to make sure that we, um, we differentiate for everybody. So we're all on the same page. Um, so you've come a long way from doing the, you know, the, the food delivery. Now you have bite technology. You have these kiosks in so many places. Did you mm -hmm. say airports, mm -hmm. uh, co-working places, offices, uh, hospitals, Hospital, prisons, apartment buildings, yeah, apartment all buildings. Um, and you know, that's where you're at now. Where do you see yourself in the next few, three to five years expanding to? The, I still see this as a, as a greenfield opportunity. These kiosks are intentionally very small footprint so that they can go anywhere without any build out. All, all you need is a plug. <laughs> and, um, and so I see us taking, going from the roughly 1300 that we have today to 10,000 pretty mm -hmm. easily. Um, the desire for fresh, healthy, convenient food um, is, it's everywhere. It's not a bi-coastal phenomenon. It's everywhere, not only in the United States, but um, across the globe. And do you think COVID has positively impacted you or negatively impacted you in any way uh, towards your growth? Yes, <laughs> both, <laughs> both. Um, COVID uh, on the negative, uh, and we're coming out of this, workplaces closed over the last year. And so because so many of these kiosks were at workplaces, the transaction volume really dropped on that side of things. On the flip side, it, we really opened just entirely new segments that we were not pursuing. Um, so we've been uh, uh, growing our relationship with HMS Host. They're deployed now at like 30 airports across the US, both in the terminals as well as in some uh, American Airlines Admirals Clubs. Uh, and then the, so, so workplaces will, kind of if we fast forward over the next six months, this is kind of our sweet spot as offices that are reopening are planning to reopen. And, and I think what's really fascinating is there's, we're seeing a few buckets of what organizations are doing. Some are just going fully remote um, and seeing that it works and they're continuing in that manner. 100% of employees will be remote. Then there's the opposite end of the spectrum where People are just, they're, they're going to go back to work. Remote won't be an option. It'll be basically kind of going back to the usual norm of, of, of business. And then there's a number in the middle where it's this kind of blended workforce, some working remotely, many who have moved out of, you know, away from their, their headquarters and then some at the home office. And that's really where a new opportunity exists for Byte is many of these locations that had cafeterias with reduced people on site the cafeteria no longer makes sense. Right. And so they're using our fridges to basically distribute food around um, a building or floors of a building or a campus or whatnot. That makes a lot of sense yeah. as, as things change. And what about schools? Are schools someplace that you are or are mm -hmm. considering? You're Absolutely. Probably. Yeah, we are, I'd say our, our biggest foothold is within higher education, universities and community colleges, but um, we have a, a number in um, like K through eight and high school, high schools as well, serving both the faculty and um, in the students in some cases. Yeah, because I could envision that being a great place to be. I remember when I was in school, I'd love to pull a healthy snack out instead of something that oh, was totally and you play, you know, you're staying late for sports and you've got you're starving and you don't have anything available. Yeah. Right, because I remember they would have those little places where you can go after school to buy a snack, like a little stand. Mm -hmm. I never had anything I'd liked anyway, so. <laughs> the other thing that I would think that could be interesting is I know that after on Saturdays or, uh, okay, you know, what? we're gonna take a quick break okay. just for two seconds. Okay. Essential Ingredients is powered by Next Gen Chef. Next Gen Chef is a movement that supports food and beverage entrepreneurs around the world by fostering a sense of community and providing its members access to mentors and a wealth of resources and guidance. Next Gen Chef feeds members with the knowledge they need to build better for you food and beverage businesses so the world can have greater access to healthier food, comprehensive food education, and increased affordability. 
If you like what you hear on this podcast, continue the conversation or ask new questions on the Next Gen Chef app, available in the Apple Store and Google Play. Follow Next Gen Chef on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Next Gen Chef. Join Next Gen Chef and let's change the future of the food industry together. Okay. <laughs> So what I was thinking as we come back from our break, <laughs> um, a lot of schools uh, with the sports on Saturdays uh, or even after school where they have their snack shacks yeah, and they have all these, I noticed that I've gone, uh, the pizza yeah. hall has their snack shacks, right? At yeah. the schools, they have yeah. a lot of unhealthy snacks. Oh yeah, they're, it's brutal. <laughs> Great option. The parents, they don't need to sit in the snack shack, frankly, they'd rather watch their kids from the bleachers. Right doing the sports, right? Yeah. That's why the kids get a nice fresh snack. Yeah, that's, I've, I've never heard of that idea. And it, we've been at this six and a half years. So thank you. That's an interesting one. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even a parent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it highlights just how many use cases there are for this. There, there are, I mean, I could go through, John Hopkins is using our kiosk to sell breast pump supplies. We have oh, a, brilliant. a gas station that has the kiosk next to the pump selling food for those that are on the go. I mean, there, it's just, there's so many novel ways of, of using the technology, which is part of the excitement of growing this company. It sounds like there's a lot. And I'm sure, um, I mean, our listeners, some of them may know this and some of them don't, but your partner is your husband. Mm -hmm. so I'm sure that you guys brainstorm a lot together. Mm -hmm. I'm right here. So <laughs> are there any fun ideas that you guys have come up with together? since you guys are brainstorming for the future on places that we might see this, that you guys are investigating? Yeah, we, um, I think a lot of the focus right now is just, is, is getting the word out quite honestly and, and thinking of creative ways to get the word out. We're, we have a lot of small businesses on the platform and they're, they're learning how to use both the technology as well as kind of open this new revenue channel, which has its own you know, there's a certain way of selling a service into a location and then figuring out how you actually operate and replenish the fridges and how you manage that account, so to say. And so we're doing a lot more content um, through what we call Byte Academy, which is basically sharing all the learnings uh, and know-how that we gained over the few years operating the business. Um, but to go back to your question in terms of like some fun things that we brainstormed or I could say some directions that we're heading is, is thinking beyond a fridge format and into other formats like ambient and a freezer um, is one of the directions that we want to head. Um, there's a lot that we'd like to do in terms of harnessing the insights that we have across the entire Byte fleet to add even more value to our clients. Um, you know, when you get over a thousand kiosks, 2000 kiosks, the more that come online and the more variety of locations you have, you can help inform the assortment and um, help with the sell through of, of these operators that we're powering. So we're excited about that too. And, I, and I, you mentioned just a minute ago, a little bit about the education and Byte Academy. Was that what you said, Byte Academy? Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that? We get a lot of founders and startups listening to these podcasts. And I'd love to be able to sh have you share some of the insights that you have for these founders as they're starting their own startups and they're going through some of these challenges. Maybe you can lend some of that information or insights for them. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's so many. I've learned every lesson in the book. I'm, I'm sure of it. Actually, no, I'm sure. I'm, there's always more oh, every day. That's one of, that's one of the learnings, right? Is that <laughs> just when you've got it figured out, you reach a new scale and you have to break things again and rebuild. Um, and so it's, it's a constant, it's a constant learning slope. Um, and it's not just within your business, you know, it's within fundraising and insurance and, you know, you're managing your legal team and, um, HR, it's just, it's everything. And I think that's part of the fun is that if you really have a, a thirst to learn and be challenged, there's no better way to do it than starting your own company. And I also think it's the greatest, it's been my greatest source of personal and professional development, certainly, um, just far and away. And what's it like to start a business with your husband? It is, uh, it's, it works very well for us. We have, 
Before we started Byte, we we did some like little side projects. So we both had our day jobs, and then um, we we'd work together on these little side projects. And that was kind of our first taste of working together, and we, and we worked very well together. I think early on we figured out uh, just after talking to other married founders is um, have clear swim lanes and clear ownership. It was it was kind of we both agreed that I should step into the CEO role and that he should run sales and, and our client success teams. Um, and, and I respect that that's his domain and he owns a lot of the decisions there and he respects that I'm running the organization. Um, I think the other piece is we have three young kids. So we have <laughs> Isla who's seven, Noah who's four and Micah who just turned two yesterday. Um, and so they were all born during this journey which adds another element to it. I think that um, having your co-founder as your husband with three young kids, there's just a natural empathy mm -hmm. where if one of us is up early on calls and the other person is just taking on packing lunches and getting everybody ready and vice versa. So it's, it's worked well. It sounds like it sounds like it's a true partnership in all sense in, in all areas. <clears throat> um, and I wonder, I wonder how it would be. I wonder if all family, if all husband and wives would say that. I'm sure not. Right? I'm sure not. <laughs> you guys sound like you're really you've got a well oiled machine. And I don't know that everyone would say that. <laughs> well, it, it comes with its own bumps in the road. Certainly. My gosh, when everything's <laughs> that intertwined, it's inevitable. And then, and there's, I mean, there's challenges too. Like when in fundraising, there's some, certain investors that will not, they just won't invest in husband and wife teams. Cause and they've probably been burned. How do you address that? How do you address a-, a You don't, a, you move on. You, you move on. It's, yeah. it's a non-starter. Yes. <laughs> non-starter. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, there's some things, there's some battles you just don't, you don't yeah. fight. It's yeah, just exactly right. right. I, I understand that. So, so to those founders out there listening, is there any uh, advice that you would, you want to leave them with or uh, give them? Um, what advice would I give? When I, it was funny when, before we started this company, I was, at, um, I was in business school and some entrepreneurship class and, and a founder was talking to the class and he said that whatever you choose to do, make sure you have a lot of passion and conviction for it because you're going to be doing it for on average seven plus years. And I kind of thought to myself, yeah, right. <laughs> years, it sounds so long. And here it is like six and a half years in. And that's, that's the accurate, the data shows that the average exit takes about seven years. So I think that is really important to, to have, um, you could call it passion, you could call it conviction, call it just a strong belief that this little baby company that you're working on should exist. And that's always what I come back to because when you're at it year after year, there's times when you're just, you know, you, you've been on an, what feels like a really steep uphill slope, pushing the boulder uphill, and you have to be able to come back to that. Do I still believe, do I still think that this should exist in the world? And as long as that's a hell yeah, then I keep coming back. Um, so I think I would, I would say that. I have to agree. I mean, for any entrepreneur, you gotta, if you're in it and you're breathing it and you're doing it every day, you really gotta have a lot of love and affection for what you're doing and drive yeah, uh, yeah. and passion for it. Cause otherwise it's the, I, I don't have another reason to get up in the morning to do it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing. And reminding yourself to come back to that. Cause sometimes you have to like, just make the conscious choice to come back to that and just like, let it marinate again and recharge you. Because it is, it's the, it's like the shot of juice that keeps you going. But I think what you just said is accurate. It's a conscious choice. Being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur is a choice mm -hmm. and having a vision and having building a company and coming up with bite technology and deciding to take that leap of faith and build that business with your husband and say, this is what we're going to build. This is the impact we're going to have on the world. We're going to be able to make healthy food more accessible and fresh food more accessible. And this is the choice we're making mm -hmm. is just that a choice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's a privilege too. Yeah. It's a privilege yeah. in my, in my mind. It's a privilege. Yeah. So, um, 
and I don't think everyone has that drive and that privilege that that determination to be able to do it. That's why we've got people in the world that everybody, you know, a variety of people that want to do different things. That's true. <laughs> I mean, really. We need all of them. We need right. everybody in the world. If there's a place, there's a reason everyone wants to do different things. Yeah. That's why we all have to go after what we want to do. Yes, absolutely. Hallelujah. Yeah. I, mean, I truly believe that, right? You know, in any event. Um, so I have to ask. So if you're if we were to ask your husband, and I ask everybody this, yeah, that has a business partner, a business, mm -hmm. a, a, a life partner, etc. What how would he describe you? as his partner? Oh, that's such a, that's a really good question. Um, how would he describe me? Um, he would describe, I guess he tells me this regularly is that I'm very good at coming into a problem anywhere in the company and kind of slicing right to either the right questions to ask or the right way to get everybody on the same, in the same boat and rowing in the right direction we should be going in. Um, and he would say that I am incredibly determined. And when I want something or I see something that needs to happen, I somehow figure out a way to make that happen for better or worse sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and since he's not here, how would you describe him? Oh man, Lee could sell, what's the saying? He could sell a, a ketchup popsicle to a lady in white gloves. Okay, I've never heard that one, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> he's really good. He's just, um, he's, he's a, a, a natural, he, his background is not in sales at all, but he's just, he's a natural salesperson. Um, he has an incredible way of, of both kind of conveying information and then connecting with the person on the other line. Um, and just like a fantastic sense of humor. Well, you two make a great team and you're, you've got so many places to take your company, it sounds like. Yeah. And it only looks like it's, it only sounds like it's going to expand and grow leaps and bounds. And I can't wait to come back and talk to you uh, in the next six months or a year and see where you guys are expanding and, and growing and going to. So I hope we, you can come back soon and tell us where else you're going and what else we'll you got on the horizon. Yeah, we'll about that. But uh, I appreciate you joining me here today on Essential Ingredients. And it was great to talk to you. How would our, our uh, listeners get in touch with you. So let's see, um, you are, you can check out by technology on, uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Um, and our site is bytetechnology.co. Um, I'm happy to talk with anyone directly. My, my email is Megan, M-E-G-A-N at bytetechnology.co. And that's byte with a Y. Okay. And again, to all our listeners out there today, thank you so much for joining us at Essential Ingredients. It's powered by Next Gen Chef. And if you want to listen to us, we are on all the regular stations on iHeartRadio and iTunes, etc. And we hope to see you here every week on Tuesday. So thanks again, Megan, for joining us. Thanks, and thank you to all our listeners for joining us here. To find out more about this episode of Essential Ingredients and access show notes, check out Next Gen Chef and choose podcast in the menu bar. If you like this episode, head to iTunes or Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel to subscribe. Learn more about Next Gen Chef, the platform that powers this podcast, by checking out our website or visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Next Gen Chef. You can also check out my Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. If you have thoughts about this episode or future episode ideas, leave us a comment at Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel or drop an email at team at nextgenchef.com. Thanks for joining us.